Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang tamang sanghang namasami So the theme for the uh, Sunday afternoon talk today is how to work with self-sabotaging tendencies. So I thought this was an interesting theme. And uh, please, you can sit around the front. Don't be shy. Lots of empty cushions here. So this... um, uh, I thought it would be an interesting uh, theme. It's um, a bit more of a, of a psychological angle or in terms of the, uh, the terminology, but uh, it's uh, states of the human mind that have been experienced over many centuries uh, and uh, something that touches our lives. Yeah, and when we use the word self-sabotage, that might not be. I realise that might not be a familiar term to to, to many folks. Uh, so I thought to just uh, first of all say what uh, what is meant by that. Uh, the word sabotage. Some of you might know, but probably many of you don't know. That a sabo is a is a wooden uh, a wooden sound like a clog. S a b o t a sabo, and sabotage was. Uh, um, uh, from the era when they first started to have mechanical mills and the millers and the, the weavers were losing their jobs. And so that uh, occasionally someone would ac- accidentally drop one of these wooden uh, wooden clogs into the machinery and the machinery would get damaged and it would be sabotaged so by the clog dropping into the machinery and and disabling the the weaving system from breaking. Also, those of you who are familiar with the word Luddite, uh, meaning someone who doesn't like technology or mechanics or or sophisticated um, machinery and uh, technology, um, uh, the word Luddite comes from the same kind of source, that um, there was uh, apparently a young apprentice called Ned Ludd, L-U-D-D, in one of these um, these weaving uh, factories, and whenever one of the machines broke down, had been sabotaged, <laughs> then they conveniently blamed young Ned. They said, oh, oh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, y- uh, young Ned uh, yeah, made a mistake again. And so he's a bit of a clumsy lad, apparently, according to the, some of the stories that I've read. So he was, he was blamed. And so then the word Luddite, from one who doesn't like machinery or doesn't like uh, tech, uh, uh, technology and Sophisticated things comes from young Ned Ludd. And that's all, all the, what he's most famous for in his life. Um, so to sabotage something is to obstruct a process, to, um, to uh, something that is set up to, to work in a good way. When it's sabotaged, it means it's something is done to make it not work, for it to, to cause it to, to break down. So self-sabotage. Uh, it's something that's uh, you know, witnessed uh, a, a lot in the in the world in the human mind. Uh, it, the term has grown up in the Western world, but I think it's probably a quality that's been experienced all around the planet. So what it means is uh, when we find ourselves going against our own best interests. So we have an intention. We want to do things in a particular way, or we set a, a wholesome intention say, taking the precepts or aiming to practice meditation. And then self-sabotaging is then finding ourselves following behaviors that then obstruct the very thing that we're trying to to do, the the, the quality that we're trying to to develop. Um, So on one level, it doesn't make sense. It's illogical or irrational to to sabotage uh, your own best interests. But I feel it's also uh, representative of uh, another aspect of the human mind is that rather than thinking of ourselves as an individual, 
feel it's much more useful or realistic to uh, to think of the mind as a committee. So there's a lot of different members of the committee. Any of you who sat in a meeting or <laughs> committee meetings know that there can be a lot of different opinions around the table. And so that uh, our mind is more like a committee where you have these different voices that are, are uh, expressing themselves. So um, uh, uh, when we are working to train our minds, we're trying to use the Buddha's teaching uh, and forms of practice to Im improve our lives, to bring up, uh, bring forth the qualities of, of uh, understanding, of peace, of freedom, of well-being. You know, why is it that we keep doing things that obstruct our own best interests, our own uh, uh, our own initiative? So that's what we really want. Why do we keep doing things that get in the way of that? So that's the area uh, I thought to explore today. And I don't, uh, I should also say at the beginning, I don't pretend to have all the answers, <laughs> just in case you were hoping for that. But um, uh, some, some reflections to, to uh, say, describe how I've tried to work with this area. And um, uh, we can open things up for discussion as we do uh, for all these Sunday talks to see if there's other angles of approach or different uh, aspects to it that uh, I haven't thought about or talked about. And uh, one of the reasons for the, uh, every year when we, we uh, come up with the, the, the process of coming up with these titles for these Sunday talks, I asked the nuns and the monks to make suggestions. And uh, I think we had um, 153 different titles suggested this year to choose from. So it was a big variety of possibilities. And um, this was one of them. And I thought, oh, well, that'll be interesting to explore. And, uh, but I, I also said, oh, I, it'll be interesting to explore, but I'm not sure what I'm going to say about it. <laughs> so in terms of uh, the, the, the wording, yeah, and in Buddhist tradition, Buddhist practice, we. Um, we talk about not self, or the, the the body is not self, feelings are not self, perceptions are not self, uh, mental formations, you know, thoughts, feelings, emotions, uh, imagination, and so forth are, are not self. So, um, how come we're using a la language like self sabotage? But uh, in in this, we're not talking about any kind of permanent, absolute, independent self, but just that uh, ordinary, worldly sense of uh, this life, this mind what we we tend to um think of in a in a in an ordinary everyday way just using the language in an ordinary everyday way so when the buddha was uh, someone questioned the buddha and said you, know, you you say all dhammas are not self so be dhamma anatta so how come you you use these pronouns like you know he or she or we or they or, or i you know all, all, all dhammas are not self and the buddha you can almost uh, imagine the buddha rolling his eyes like <laughs> You know, the Tathagata expresses himself according to the, uh, the, the, the forms of common speech uh, to be, in order to be easily understood and to convey his meaning uh, to people. So, that's the, so he uses words like uh, me and you and they and, and we and she and he, but without confusion, without creating the idea of a permanent separate self. So that uh, when we use a term like self-sabotage, it's in that same kind of ordinary common speech of a, of a self, not any kind of absolute permanent self. So uh, since I, I've noticed this tendency in my own life uh, for a long, long time, um, uh, repeatedly, that uh, I've been interested in it. And when I saw that the title suggested for the Sunday talk, I thought, oh, <laughs> caught my attention. Uh, and so, um, uh, Looking at, uh, looking at this over the last 30 years, 30, 40 years, uh, I first really started to notice it, I think, um, uh, in the early 90s, so uh, it'd be about 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, I be began to, to see it and consider it. And uh, seeing that my, my mind could easily do that, sort of go against or, or, or try to scramble something that seemed to be very fortunate or, 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 or appropriate or, or um, something very, very pleasant or, or good. You know, why does my mind want to obstruct that? Um, I could see it, it, it's called self-sabotage, but in a way it's also a, a kind of self-affirmation. It's sort of a deflected, if it's not, again, not too complicated, a deflected self-affirmation. So it can be uh, obstructing our own best interests like seemingly like you um, uh, you 
you, you said, okay, I'm going to spend my Sunday afternoons um, uh, practicing meditation, and then just as a, a random example, then you think, oh, oh I better, uh, I think I should call up so and so. Uh, accidentally forgetting that the last time you called them, last five times you called them up, they invited you around for tea and cakes, and so that. Uh, you, you uh, decide, I'm going to spend the whole afternoon practicing meditation, and then I'll oh, just call my friend, and then, oh, please come around for tea and cake. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and then suddenly, uh, there you are, enjoying your tea and cakes, and you're thinking, I was going to spend the whole afternoon by myself practicing meditation, and here I am spending this time with my friend. This is nice enough, but this isn't what I was intending to do. How did that happen? So, uh, that... Um, uh, uh, again, to use a phrase like de deflected um, self-affirmation, uh, uh, what, I, what I mean by that is that uh, it can be the case that um, we uh, we like to be self-critical, or we like we, we we can identify with the fact that we're a failure, or people don't like us or don't approve us. And you might think, well, that's not very nice. Why would I want that? That's not that's not a pleasant thing. But um, I would say sometimes it's that's the, the dynamic that's uh, at work, is that we uh, it's it's actually to do with affirming a sense of being. And uh, one of the the interesting things uh, about the the Buddha's enlightenment and the stories of the, the Buddha's awakening was that after his enlightenment, uh, his first inclination was not to try to teach because he had this, this recognition that, that the, 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 uh, the human population, the people of the world, uh, he's, as he said, uh, are committed to becoming. They, they, they relish becoming uh, and, uh, and being. They, uh, they know only the, the love of, of being. And to speak uh, about letting go of that relishing of, of being, of identity, of becoming, to, to encourage letting go of that, no one's going to want to hear that. Uh, and no, one, no one's going to be ready to listen. So therefore, there's, uh, if I try to teach that, if I try to encourage that bhava and nirodha, the letting go of becoming, then that'll just be wearying and troublesome for me. That'll be vexatious. I can put the effort into that, but no one's going to listen, so why bother? So that was the, the, the thread of thought in the Buddha's mind immediately after the enlightenment. Rather like say, uh, uh, recognizing that you're... Uh, you are in a in a town completely filled with with addict, with addicts, say heroin addicts. Everyone's a heroin addict except for you. And then you say, "Well, am I really going to work in the in the addiction program to try and get everyone in this whole city, the whole town, off their off their drug of choice?" It, it's too much. It's too difficult. And not to compare uh, heroin addiction with, with exactly with with the addiction to becoming and, and defined being but really that's that's i would say that's close to what the, the buddha was experiencing it's like well in a, a world completely filled with addicts i'm the only person who's not on the drug <sighs> where would you start it's it's too it's too much it's it's more than is do uh, is possible to do and then the Brahma Sahampati, the, the Brahma deity, picked up this thought in the mind of the, the newly awakened Buddha. And then, the, uh, and then Sahampati uh, realized, oh, the, the newly enlightened Buddha is inclined to solitude and to not teaching. I better intervene quickly. <laughs> so the Brahma Sahampati then appeared down in front of the Buddha and said, you know, please, uh, uh, the, for the sake of those beings who have just a, a little bit of dust in their eyes, please teach the understanding that, that you have. And then it said that the Buddha cast his vision around the world and saw that um, uh, there were beings with a lot of dust in their eyes who were heavily addicted, but also those who were only mildly addicted, that um, only had a little bit of dust in their eyes. And so for the sake of the, the, the almost dust-free, the Buddha agreed to teach. He responded to the appeal from Sahampati and here we are, you know, two and a half thousand years later, because of that, of that invitation. That's still how Dhamma talks are traditionally and customarily invited. That little formula that m many of you will have heard at the start of a Dhamma talk, where one of the community chants, Brahma, Chaloka, Dipati, Sahampati, Katanjali, 
uh, and so on. That's recounting that very incident. Like, uh, so the lay person's putting themselves in the position of the Brahma Sahampati, and then whoever's giving the Dhamma talk is putting themselves in, in the place of the, you know, the, the role played by the Buddha. So I would say that mysteriously, self-sabotage is to do with that love of defined being. And even though you think, well, why would you want to be a failure? Or why would you want to be rejected? Or why would you want to always feel there's something wrong? <laughs> or that uh, you're not good enough? And who would want that? But uh, it can be that, um, that we're so uh, identified, or so it's such a strong sense of I and me and mine, around even uncomfortable, painful, uh, negative qualities, that if something challenges that, we, we push it away. And I don't want to be too psychological, <laughs> but uh, I, I think I feel this is a, a helpful area to to look at. So, and where I first recognised it or began to look at it in myself was um, about, again about thirty years ago uh, in the early nineties, when um, uh, myself and one of the nuns were had been looking after the winter retreat lay support team. So every winter retreat we have. Uh, um, about 40 uh, Sangha members uh, on retreat here, and then usually about 20, 25 lay people who come in and help to do all the, the cooking and looking after the office and, uh, and taking care of any errands and such like while the, the monastic community uh, engage in formal practice. So there's usually one, uh, one of the nuns and one of the monks look after either part of the retreat or all of the retreat. Anyway, at the end of this retreat, the, the winter retreat was over and it had been um, uh, quite colourful in some respects, uh, dealing with various different issues. And I was sitting in the old sala um, and sort of de debriefing with the, the sister who had been the other liaison uh, with myself. And, uh, and she just made this, this comment of saying, oh, thank you very much, it was, so, uh, it was so helpful to work with you, it was really in enjoyable, and, uh, and I think we, we did a, a really um, a, a good job taking care of the, the lay support team and looking after the winter retreat. And it was, uh, I, I can't remember the details of the words, but it was very sincere, very straightforward, and it was just a, like an, uh, an, uh, uh, a, a very direct expression of, of friendship, and openness and appreciation. And something in me said, don't, <laughs> don't, don't be nice like that. And I, and I made some kind of wisecrack and just sort of de deflected her, her kind of appreciative comments. And, um, and I, uh, even as uh, I had just said that, or just sort of pushed that away, I made, it, I made a joke and just sort of dismissed it. And, and uh, it really stuck with me. I thought, well, that was weird. Why did I do that? It was just a, a very simple, you know, un, unloaded uh, gesture of, of friendship, of support, of, of appreciation. And something in me said, oh, no, 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 don't, <laughs> don't, uh, don't, uh, don't like me, don't appreciate me, don't, uh, don't accept me like that. Um, and I, I, there was nothing kind of inappropriate in terms of what she said at all. It was not... Um, uh, you know, over affectionate in any way. It was, but it was, it was very um, it was kind of straightforward and uh, and as I said, an uh, unloaded gesture of of friendship and appreciation. And something in me said, no, thank you, <laughs> I can't deal with that, or I don't want that, and just sort of pushed it away. And it was, um, it really stuck in my mind. I thought, wow, that was very strange. <laughs> why, why did I? sabotage that uh, that um, that conversation why did I, I do something to obstruct that why couldn't I just say why couldn't I just say thank you and same to you you know <laughs> but uh, so that got me that got me looking and uh, and considering uh, that whole area uh, again not not to get too sort of drawn into it but I felt that was that was a, a, a single incident that highlighted that particular tendency. And I started off, I think, by just by not, I didn't really have the word self-sabotage at that point, but just like, what happened there? Why did I push that away? What was, what was so, so wrong or so unacceptable uh, about that? Why couldn't I just receive that, uh, that quality of, of kindness and, and, uh, and say um, friendship from others? And, and then I, re I remembered uh, Ajahn Sumedho talking about when uh, uh, a couple of years earlier, when he'd been at Lumpur Cha's funeral, 
in uh, in Thailand, and this was a huge event. About uh, uh, about a million people came through Wat Bafong uh, over the ten day period of Ajahn Chah's funeral, and uh, about half a million on the actual day of the funeral, because it's four four or five hundred thousand. So on, on one of the evenings prior to the actual funeral ceremony. Um, then he he had been up on the the the, the, step, the surround of the, the stupa the, the chetia that had been built for Ajahn Chah's funeral, and there were these you now tens of literally hundreds of thousands of people all around, <laughs> and uh, the um, uh, the uh, a, te a television crew had been interviewing another of the senior monks uh, on the steps of the stupa, and then they finished the interview. Uh, he stepped out of the way, and then. Then the Ajahn Sumato was introduced, and also we have Ajahn Sumato, who's been uh, establishing the community in in Europe, and uh, he's uh, uh, Ajahn Chah's most senior Western disciple, and uh, and uh, we're very happy that he is here this evening. So he was sat down on the, the middle seat in front of the, the stupa, and then people started coming towards him, and uh, and and I remember that uh, Lumpur Sumato saying at first he's like no 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 no. <laughs> He wasn't that physically afraid, but just that kind of wave of affection and reverence. He said something in him just said, "No, no, don't, don't, don't love me like that, or don't, uh, don't bring me your your reverence, your adoration, your your uh, your wandana." And then some, he said, so a voice in his mind said, "Sumato, just let go, let them, let them appreciate you," <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, I'd remember that, and that had been not very long before this incident with uh, with myself. And so I thought, yeah, maybe that's it. There's something that just doesn't want to receive the kindness and goodwill of others. And what is it that wants to stop that? Anyway, not to get too lost in that. I feel that uh, that sense of... of um, uh, it can be very strong in our minds, but but unconscious that, yeah, I'm not worthy, or I'm a failure, or... Um, um, I feel most alive when I'm in this, when I've um, um, done something wrong or I'm being criticized. Even though we don't like it, it might give us the strongest sense of identity. And so that if we have to let go of that identity, then we're in that state of undefined being, that uh, bhavani rodha. So that, uh, and as, as I said, that when when the Buddha was enlightened, he thought, well, the whole world is addicted to bhava tanha, to the to defined being, and to encourage people to let go of defined being, a defined sense of identity. Then no one's going to want that. Yeah, no one's going to want to come off the drug. So that uh, the. Um, uh, so I, I, in those years, I began to look back and think, well, so. I tend to be very anxious, and uh, when my mind lets go of one, uh, solves one problem, then it hunts for another thing to be worried about. Like when one problem is solved, as I sort of go, ah, oh, thank goodness that's done, then I can find my mind like searching, like a, like a, <laughs> like a searchlight, like, okay, there must be something else I should be worrying about. And I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but then you, you, uh, at that moment you haven't got anything to worry about, and you think, oh, there must be something. There must be something I should be doing. And like the searchlight kind of, where is it, where is it? Where is it? And then you think, oh yes, I've got to write all those, I've got to write all those uh, articles, or I've got to make those phone calls, or... Uh, the email didn't exist in those days, so I wouldn't have thought I have to write all those emails. But, <laughs> but anyway, the, all those things I've got to do, and then and then when you remember your your great big set of duties, then you think, oh, thank goodness, I have got something to worry about, and something in you feels relieved because I've got to do that stuff, and I haven't done it yet, and they will be expecting me to do it. Again, not to get drawn into too drawn into the psychology of it. So I began to think back, and that, so I tend to. Uh, make myself worried a lot. And why do I keep seeking the state of being anxious? When there's nothing to worry about, my mind will hunt for a problem to worry about, and then I make it my problem. So, so I'm, it, this is definitely causing an obstruction. It's a sabo in the, in the weaving machine. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, so I keep making my mind uh, anxious and, and uh, uptight. So where's that coming from? 
And again, I realize this is somewhat pop psychology, but I, I was looking back into my life and I thought, well, where, when did I first start really feeling anxious? When, when, what's my earliest memory of anxiety? And um, so I, uh, I cast my mind back, <laughs> you know, over, this was over a, a few weeks or months I was sort of exploring all this. And then I remembered when I was about, f about four or five years old, um, I had um, I had done something. Uh, I had, uh, in the, I lived in a uh, in the countryside in Kent uh, on a little farm, uh, and I had uh, done something that was that was uh, really really wrong, really bad, and to upset one of my sisters, and um, and uh, I had taken something that that belonged to one of my sisters, and I you know thrown it away, hidden it, and sort of, and um, had. And which was really, you know, bad and wrong and shouldn't do, and um, and so and I was really, sh uh, really afraid of being caught, being found out, and so and I uh, I uh, left the, our, our home and gone off to a, down the down the lane, and I'd hidden in the in the barn of the local farmer, Mr. Brom Mr. Bromley's barn. I remember the name. <laughs> And I was just hiding there, sort of waiting for punishment to arrive, or being caught, or being found out. Or, and and I thought, yeah, I was really afraid. Uh, I was, uh, but I was definitely that was the that was the only thing happening in the world was me hiding in this barn, waiting to be waiting to be caught, waiting to be found out, waiting to be punished. Uh, my little four-year-old me, um, maybe maybe five, <laughs> but somewhere around there. And uh, so I was there for a long time, and I don't know how long, but they, and then I, after a while I could hear me, uh, my mum and dad sort of calling out my name, and, and then uh, and also I think I was getting hungry as well. So I eventually thought, okay, I've got to, I've got to, be, got to be brave, and, I, and, I, and they're going to they're gonna find out, they're going to punish me, they're going to know I took this thing of my sister's and, and threw it away uh, so, so that it couldn't be found again. And then... Um, and it must have been a good couple of hours because when I appeared from from the from the barn and uh, arrived back at our cottage, at the farmhouse, then uh, there was no no word of uh, of any punishment or anything having been done wrong. I thought, oh, oh, yeah, I got away with it, which is not a very good thought to have. But you know, I was not spiritually very mature at that age. <laughs> So, uh, but then looking back on this this area of self sabotage, I think, well, that's I was definitely very alive. It was a very intense experience. It was very painful, but it was definitely me. And the only thing that was happening in the universe was the the, the only thing that was happening was this. Uh, here, I, I got to hide. I don't want to be caught. Be afraid. And so I thought, well, and again, I might be totally deluded on this, but I thought, well, I, I got a sense that that was the most, uh, the, the earliest sense of intense being in my life, and it was around fear. So maybe I keep, uh, and fear, and fear of, uh, of punishment or fear of rejection, and maybe I keep going back to that because that's when I felt most alive. And that that was a, if nothing else, there was a sense of defined being around that, even though it was uncomfortable and painful. So uh, I began to to ponder that and think, well, maybe that's that's what happens: is that when when there is the um, that quality of affirmation, or things are going really well, or there's a, a gestures of approval, like from my my sister, who was the other retreat uh, liaison. Um, Maybe when there's that approval or, or, or that kind of um, uh, that sense of, of yes, you know, yes, you belong, yes, you've done well, yes, this is this is very pure. Something um, is inside is risking that 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 sense of defined being, uh, and that and so it will fend off the, those feelings or those qualities of, of goodness or wholeness or approval or uh, saying yes you are you know you, you are you are a fine person and it pushes it away says no 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 i am this other thing i'm this this uh, other kind of of, uh, of being because that's the as they say the devil that you know <laughs> it gives you a sense of, of i and me and mine so uh that um i, I wouldn't say this is the the, the whole story at all, but uh, that 
um, the mind gravitating to things where the, that we are most attached to, even if it's a, a problem we have or something that we've done that's, that was hurtful or a dreadful mistake or something we, we regret, it can be painful, but it can be the most precious thing that we have. And uh, I also uh, was reminded how um, uh, Gurdjieff, who was a famous spiritual teacher in, in Europe in the early part of the 20th century and uh, very influential, and he had a, a, community, a spiritual community that he had established in, in, uh, in Paris uh, in, the, in the 20s and 30s. And uh, during that, that time of this community that he had, he said one of the comments he made was, you can take anything away from people except for their suffering. They'll hang on to that until death. And, uh, um, and similarly, uh, another, uh, another um, uh, quotation that uh, uh, I like to pass on is from the era of the, uh, when the, uh, the end of, of the Soviet Union, where um, uh, Mr. Gorbachev had instituted perestroika and glasnost and um, was sort of reshaping the way that the Soviet Union operated. And uh, at one point, the foreign minister, Mr. Shevardnadze, was in Washington to, and trying to convince the American government that they that uh, Gorbachev meant business and he was very sincere in trying to liberalize things in, in the Soviet Union. And um, apparently there was this meeting um, in, in Washington uh, where Mr. Sherrod Nadza, who was, uh, he spoke pretty, pretty good English and was, and was very, um, a forthright person, and he's in this room with all these Washington politicians, and he looked around the table and said, excuse my bad Russian accent, we are going to do something terrible to you. And he looked around the table and they thought, oh, it's going to be news about the, the neutron bomb or some kind of death ray. Or, and he said, we are going to deprive you of an enemy. And he was very wise. I thought, absolutely on the mark. We're going to deprive you of an enemy. And, that's, uh, and that was about 1991, 92. <laughs> no, about 1990, I think that was. So in the early 90s. And so that was having a defined enemy, a defined problem. It gives you that, that which we're opposed to. You think, well, it'd be great not to have an enemy. It'd be great not to have a problem. But without that problem, without that thing that we feel bad about or, or that's opposed to us, then... Who are we if we haven't got an enemy? Who am I if I haven't got a problem? If all my problems are solved, if I haven't got anything to worry about, who am I? <laughs> so we prefer to have a problem, we prefer to have an enemy or a difficulty uh, than not knowing what we are. So to go on to how do we work with <laughs> self-sabotaging tendencies? Um, and uh, again, I, w I would say this isn't the whole story, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, I would say um, is helpful to look at for us because many of us can recognize these, these tendencies within ourselves. So there's two basic approaches. Uh, one is using, uh, that, I, uh, that I've used myself or that come to mind. Uh, one is the power of wise reflection. So using your, your mind's ability to recognize patterns and how things work to uh, to explore uh, how that process works how, why we keep obstructing going against our own best wishes or why we look for a problem when all our problems are over why do we look for another one or when all our, all our enemies have, have made friends and given up uh, then why do we look for another enemy or another problem why do we do that uh, so wise reflection um, uh, is the, the first area and so that um, that um, uh, so within that wise reflection, I would say looking at uh, what what happened in a particular process where you did like like I was describing that dialogue with uh, with uh, the the sister all those years ago, thirty years ago. So just that sense of replaying the incident. Okay, what happened there? So what was uh, what was the run up? What was said? Where, what was going on in my mind? Can I identify that? Can I see that? And what, what was going on there? So, so replaying the, the incident and looking at how things worked, how things fitted together. So that's, uh, and then through that, um, uh, that kind of process, then uh, see, seeing how things are pieced together. So like, 
and I was doing a lot of that um, in that incident. They say, hey, where did that come from? Or why was that so off-putting? Or, or, or what does that remind me of? And then, as I said, uh, oh yeah, Lumpur said something about when he was at the, the Lumpur child's funeral, that feeling of, oh, don't love me. <laughs> that feeling and how he, he said, no, that, uh, this, this, inner, this inner wisdom, this intuitive wisdom in his heart said, no, just don't be afraid, don't push that away, just let them... Uh, let the crowd express their their, their joy in, in who you are and what you do. Um, so that wise reflection on on the, on what what has happened and, and where it has has come from, and uh, so that uh, and then it's quite okay to then sort of have tentative ideas. Like, well, it might be this or it might be that. This seems to be part of it. This. This uh, this might be uh, this might be what's contributing. So having a, a few different um, theories or, or perspectives uh, on the boil, I feel is quite helpful. Like, well, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but this seems to be involved. Because another maybe another thing to, to share along the way was so I, when I was um, after that time, I was living in in California. We'd started up a Bhagiri monastery. So this was about six or seven years later. And uh, I was uh, helping to prepare a, a Dhamma teaching program in, with a Tibetan teacher, a Zen teacher, and myself. The three of us were putting a, a Buddhist teacher's program together. And we, uh, the, the Zen teacher was called Yvonne Rand, and she was from the San Francisco Zen Center. The Tibetan teacher was a man called Ken McLeod. And we'd meet every month or every six weeks at Yvonne's place in Muir Beach, a very wonderful sort of rambling house called Goat in the Road, because her goats would often get out and she'll be told there's a <laughs> there's a goat in the road your, your goats are in the road so she actually changed the name of the house to being goat in the road so we'd meet at goat in the road every few weeks and uh, one time the, the subject of self-sabotage came up and Yvonne just said well you know you know about the relationship between uh, adult children of alcoholic parents and self-sabotage I said what and she said, oh, yes, yes, yeah, here. And she kind of fished through a, a, a pile of articles and said, here, you know, read this. And this was some, it wasn't an association I'd made at all. But she said, oh, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's well known or uh, well, well uh, acknowledged that sometimes what makes us uh, sabotage our, go against our own best interests is having had a very unreliable parent, uh, you know, a parent or both parents who are alcoholic. And so that can be one of the reasons why we we go against our own best interests, our own uh, uh, our own uh, say best uh, intentions. I thought, and had never put those two together in my in my life. I thought, wow, that's a strange idea. And then she gave me this article to read, and it was kind of like reading my family history. I thought. Well, this is spooky. <laughs> like, who, who, is, who, wrote the, who wrote this article and how did they know? It's like, yeah, it's exactly like that. Huh. And uh, I'd ne not to insult my dear dad, but I'd never thought of him as an alcoholic, but uh, a, a day did not pass without, uh, without him drinking. And he was a very controlled drinker. He would never drink before noon, but at just after 12, <laughs> the, the cap of the Vant 69 whiskey bottle would, would come off. And, I was given my own beer mug uh, by uh, by him when I was six, <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. I was six, and uh, I'd have an inch of beer at Sunday lunch once a week, and the on the basis of quote unquote he has to start sometime. <laughs> so uh, those sort of things started coming back to me. So I don't uh, I don't think it's the only cause, or, or uh, I'm not sure exactly how that works but it was very very interesting to to get that and to read uh, an article written by an american psychologist that seemed to describe this rural english fa family absolutely perfectly i thought wow that's there's obviously some some connections there some threads there and so the degree to which um, those insecurities uh, hatch and maybe that's part of it so going back to what can we what we can do to work with self-sabotaging tendencies so first of all looking at the the the, the anatomy of particular incidents and exploring the uh, the way that they have taken shape then a, a second approach is uh, and this is what uh, Ajahn Chah would often recommend when you're following some kind of desire or some sort of mood you're caught up in in 
scrambling your own best interests, that you you were going to uh, stop, uh, uh, you were only going to eat uh, as much as you needed for, let's say, for monastics. Uh, when the the meal is the only interesting thing that happens during the day, which is often the case at Wat Bapong. <laughs> so if you made the firm resolution, as soon as I know that I've had enough, or five more mouthfuls will be enough, then I will stop and finish with water, just as it says in the in the scriptures you're supposed to do. And then you're 15 mouthfuls past. <laughs> Past that point, and the, so Ajahn Chah would say, when you know you've lost it, then that's the point. That's the point to establish mindfulness, and don't worry too much about what uh, what's gone before. But okay, when you're you've been caught up in a mood, and or you you're you're angry with someone, and you're in the middle of a rant, at the moment you realise. I'm ranting, or I've really got lost. That's the point to to just to stop, to establish mindfulness, and to uh, to then uh, look at uh, what has just happened. So, if your mind is in that self-sabotaging process, you're kind of getting caught up in something, getting carried away with something, getting lost in self-criticism or anxiety, or whatever. That moment when the mind recognizes, oh, what, why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? That's the moment to establish mindfulness. So that's the second aspect of wise reflection. The third one is sometimes those um, states are unstoppable. And uh, I, again, I'm not reading anybody's mind, but I would suspect we've all been in this situation where you say, oh, I said I wasn't going to do this, and I'm doing it again. And even though I'm doing it again, and I said I wasn't going to do it, I'm not stopping doing it, even as I'm saying. <laughs> Even as I'm thinking in this way, again, not to get too complicated, but uh, I said I wasn't going to do this, I'm doing it again, and even though I realize I'm doing it again, I am not stopping. <laughs> so I'm not condoning that, but just recognizing that's how it is for us as human beings. I, I've, I've got lost in it again, and it's moving, it's got some weight, some momentum, some strength behind it, and it's... Uh, this is what's happening. And again, Ajahn Chah, would, he was very familiar with these kind of things, and he said, if this is what your mind is doing, and you can't stop yourself from gorging on some food, or ranting at somebody, or uh, indulging in some kind of uh, state, um, a, you know, a stream of, of, of worries, or self-criticisms, or whatever it might be, then uh, at least establish the fact that this is what you're doing. This is what's going on. It doesn't seem to be stoppable. And to that, and that moment, okay, this has got so much momentum behind it. Just to, at least to establish the mindfulness as you're following the behavior to recognize this is really going to hurt. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to regret this when this is over, but it's not over yet. And so he said, if uh, just that amount of mindfulness uh, and, and reflection, like, okay, I said I wasn't going to do this. I'm still doing it. It's not stopping. This is going to really hurt. And okay, where where is this going to go? And then, and it's interesting yeah, since that, you know, I've certainly had to employ that approach many many times over the years, unfortunately. <laughs> But there is that, that that element of wisdom that's able to watch what's going on, and you say, "Oh yeah," and then and then there's this, "Oh yeah," and then there's this, "Oh yeah," and now and then now it's now now it goes on to this, "Oh yeah," now uh, this is really going to hurt. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really uh, I really am an idiot for following this, um, and so that there's at least some degree of spaciousness, some degree of clarity as you're getting lost. So there's there's something that is. Um, uh, aware of the, the 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 damaging process that's going on, and is not identified with it, is not attached to it, and then the last one is surveying the wreckage afterwards. <laughs> So after the, the sabo has been dropped in the weaving machine and the, 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 uh, the, the device has been wrecked, or picking through the wreckage, after you have uh, followed that impulse, you've, you've believed in that self-criticism, you've absorbed into that worry or that made somebody else an, an enemy or a problem, then, uh, and you've sort of bought into that, then, okay, uh, I got what I wanted, I followed that through, now, how does it feel? That was the cause, now this is the effect. So how is this? So, uh, and then rather than then letting so the habits of self-view take that over, uh, therefore I'm an idiot, how could I do this? I'm totally stupid, what kind of a, a Buddhist practitioner, what kind of a monk am I? Um, 
to, to see it in terms of nature. This is the cause, this impulse, uh, this worrying impulse, or this aversive or lustful, this, this kind of anxious impulse was followed. Okay, now here's the result. And the more that the heart can just receive that and know that in terms of, ow! <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's the cause, this is the effect, ow! Uh, and so, not seeing it in personal terms, like, uh, like Lumpur Sumedha would say, don't take your life personally. So that, uh, it, and it's, uh, some people hearing this, you might think, well, that's, that's kind of grade A spiritual bypassing, another Western psychological term. That's just spiritual bypassing, that's kind of, that's not really taking responsibility. But I say, no, if that's, if that's based on genuine wisdom, uh, we don't have to take that. You're not excusing it. You're not pretending it didn't happen. Uh, it happened, and it's stu it was stupid to follow that, that impulse of uh, ranting at somebody or, or creating another problem, committing to another debt. When you just got one debt paid off, you, get, you take out another loan and get another debt. Because um, it can be not just in terms of psychological uh, states, it can be also the way you live and the, your financial commitments. Um, like as soon as you you got rid of one debt, you create another. Again, I'm not spying on anybody. So. How did he know? <laughs> but uh, that the, just to um, see. Well, there's the cause. There's the effect. How does it feel? Ow. Okay. Let that be what teaches. Let, let that be learned from. So then that. Um, uh, that kind of, uh, of dynamic is saying, well, that, that's how it works. If this is followed, it, this is what, uh, uh, this is the result of it. If this is the cause, then this is the effect. And then the, the less verbiage, the less words around that, uh, no kind of explanation or self-justification or self-criticism, but just here's the cause, here's the effect, ow. And I often say that the more wordless, the appreciation of that is the more effective, uh, the more fully that lesson is learned, because it's it's a non-rational process. Uh, this self-sabotaging is it's not rational. It doesn't doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know, to the rational mind. It's a non-rational, so sort of instinctive, reactive, mental process. Uh, so um, just being able to. Um, uh, to appreciate, here's the cause, here's the effect, and just let the, the painfulness of the result be what teaches us, because that's what we mostly learn from, is, is painful experiences, unfortunately. Uh, and again, Lumpur Chah recognized this, he, said, he would say, um, if we have too much happiness and pleasure, then we just fall asleep. Uh, dukkha is what, pain is what teaches us, so that that uh, helps to keep us, keep us awake, so that uh, it's good to practice in a way that you're, you're testing yourself, There's, that your skillful use of discomfort is a uh, very important principle in spiritual life. So you're letting yourself feel that uh, mental discomfort, <coughs> rather than just distracting yourself with with things to, to do, or places to go, or, you know, or things to eat, or, or to drink, or to conversations to have, or you know, the many, many and various distractions. So you're letting that painful mental state be known, with no additions and no and no kind of um, conceptualization around it. And then that, that that has the most powerful effect in teaching us. The other approach, um, along with wise reflection. I would, is what they call samagochara, which means right resort, or um, not putting yourself in a situation where those things happen. So this is um, uh, the kind of advice the Buddha would give, would be um, uh, don't walk around in the dark at night time, otherwise you'll easily fall into a ditch or into a cesspit, or you'll, you'll trip over and injure yourself. Um, so that uh, avoid wandering around in the dark, otherwise you'll injure yourself. Um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a saying, uh, if you sit in a barber's chair long enough, you're about, you're, eventually you'll get a haircut. <laughs> or if you're, if you're trying to give up drinking, don't, go, don't take a job in a pub. You know, it's, it's, you're, you're putting yourself in a, in a dangerous position. So, Samagochara, a right resort, with respect to, um, to this kind of self-sabotaging tendencies, is... Um, Notice the situations that uh, that are, uh, are that you you get into 
um, see what the pattern is of how you get into those those uh, states and get lost in them. See what the 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 the, the um, situation is where where you get caught up, where you get carried away, and avoid putting yourself in those situations uh, uh, to to not um, essentially don't go there, <laughs> so that. You are, are um, so uh, going back to the example I gave earlier. So, okay, you made the resolution Sunday afternoon, formal practice all afternoon. Then, then when that thought arises, oh, I'll give my friend a call. Then to think, wait, don't go there. You know what happened the last time? The last three times you you gave him a call, um, you ended up going over and having tea, tea and cakes rather than and, and watching movies rather than doing your meditation. So, don't pick up the phone. <laughs> That's just you know, one random example. So, uh, avoiding creating the conditions where it's easier to get lost, where it's easier to get drawn into those those destructive uh, processes. Another thing, I, I, an aspect to it, I, I thought to share that again come from a, our tradition is where those self sabotaging tendencies are not followed, and we have uh, quite a lot of uh, examples in the in the suttas where Mara comes to visit the Buddha. And I, I feel that even though Mara is, pre, is presented as a, a sort of physical entity who comes along and has, has conversations with the Buddha uh, and appears in that very, uh, uh, very kind of, uh, apparent um, physical form, uh, I, uh, I feel that it's, it's also displaying dialogues going on in the Buddha's mind. So, for example... Um, when uh, uh, when the Buddha was was newly enlightened, when he was first uh, enlightened, then Mara came to the Buddha and said, "Well, congratulations, well done. You've, you've achieved perfect and complete enlightenment. Now you don't need to teach anyone. Don't bother anyone else with your insight. No, why don't you just go off and be a hermit? And you know you can just uh, have a nice, peaceful life, just be in the Himalayas and just enjoy the bliss of liberation. And don't tell anyone about it." And so the Buddha recognizes you know i know you mara yeah i know what this is and that uh, he'd already been encouraged by the the, the brahma sahampati to, to teach and so he knew that uh, mara was was trying to sabotage the the teaching process and uh, the, the the buddha's ability to, to teach and to share his understanding and then later on when the buddha was by himself meditating in in the himalayas and mara came along and said uh, you know you have the power you've got great psychic powers you have the power to turn the whole himalayan mountain range into solid gold if you wanted to you could do that and the buddha said yes i could but even twice that amount would not be enough for one person's greed so i know you mara and so that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, possibility of the Buddha's life being derailed and him in, indulging in ma massive wealth, like, uh, as much gold as the Himalayas, uh, he saw that, he understood that, and he uh, deflected that sabotaging tendency. So similarly, um, there was uh, when when his foot had been cut. Um, after Devadatta had rolled a rock off the mountain and tried to kill him, and the, the rock had broken and, and injured the Buddha's foot, and he was quite badly hurt. And so um, at that time, he, he went, to, his foot was injured, and he went to go and, and uh, lie down and rest in his kuti. And Mara came along and said, What are you doing? You're supposed to be a fully enlightened Buddha, lying down in the middle of the day. You know, you know, what kind of, a, of a, an attained being are you to be so to be so weak, so uh, so uh, so feeble to so lie down and take a rest in the in the daytime? And the Buddha said you know, that uh, yeah, I know you, Mara. <laughs> no, this is uh, this. Uh, uh, it's appropriate uh, this time. Then this uh, this body having been injured, to let the body rest and uh, help it to recover. And then he uses this beautiful phrase: uh, "I sleep out of compassion for all beings." I sleep out of compassion for all beings. So no, so the kindest thing I can do for the world is to lie down and go to sleep and let my body recover. So I sleep out of compassion for all beings. So you might, you have to keep that in context. It was a Buddha saying that, <laughs> not, not us goofing off halfway through our work period. Uh, but uh, and or may, many incidents like that, or, or when the the um, the the Buddha had had declared to Ananda um, 
that uh, uh, if uh, if uh, a Tathagata, if a fully enlightened Buddha so wished, they could use their their powers to live for the whole of the Kalpa. They could, they could extend, they could deliberately extend their lifespan for the whole of the Kalpa. And Ananda responded by saying, oh wow, really, is that so? Oh great, that's good. And the Buddha hinted to Ananda 48 times. So in uh, three times over in seven different, lo uh, in 14 different locations. Uh, so the, the four, uh, 42, 42 times uh, the Buddha hinted to Ananda. And then Ananda didn't get the hint to say, please, Venerable Sir, live out your life for the rest of the Kalpa. And Ananda didn't make the request, even though the Buddha had hinted over 40 times. And so then uh, after the, 40, the, the 42nd hint, the last one, the Buddha said, you know, Ananda, the Tathagata has now relinquished the, the life principle and in three months time, uh, uh, the Tathagata will realize the Parinibbana. And that's, oh no, please, 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 you said you could, a Buddha could live out the rest of the age if they were asked. And, said, and, and Buddha said, Ananda, I said this three times over, in this place, in this place, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. You know, I've, I've hinted to you, you know, in, in all these different places, and you didn't get the hint. So the Tathagata has now rel consciously relinquished the life principle, and in three months' time will, will uh, realize par the Parinibbana. And so then Mara came along and said, right, well, it doesn't have to be three months. You could actually go where, you know, right away. And the Buddha said, I know you, Mara. <laughs> I, know, I know you, Mara. No, this is not the time. I, I have relinquished the life principle, but I need to say, uh, take my leave of the community and the various different places. And so he visited many, many different communities, monasteries, and then uh, at the, under the full moon of Visaka in Kusinara, then uh, he realized the uh, parinibbana and uh, the body breathed out and didn't breathe in again so that uh, there are many, these many and various encounters with with mara i take that as being the the urge to self sabotage to go against uh, uh, your, uh, the, 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 uh, our life's own best interests and the buddha is the perfect example saying you know i know you <laughs> I know what this is. I know where this is going. I know where this went last time, and the time before that, and the time before that, and the time before that. So I know you, Mara. I know what this is. Uh, and then, through that recognition, through that knowing, then that impulse to uh, to follow the self sabotaging tendency to to go against your own interests, like to um, to turn the Himalayas into gold, or to uh, to uh, let his life end right there. Or another one was where Mara also, when he was in the Himalayas, uh, meditating by himself, Mara came along and said, um, or the, or the thought occurred in the Buddha's mind, I wonder if it would be possible to, to govern, to, to rule a country in a, a completely dharmic way. And then Mara says, yes, of course you could. You, you, of course, could. A person of your great ability is a great, a great being like you, a Mahan, Mahanaga, a great entity like you, could do that. And then the Buddha said, I know you, Mara. <laughs> it's not possible to govern without uh, imprisoning people and sequestering property and, and, uh, and, and uh, engaging in uh, unskillful activities. So it's impossible to rule uh, a country completely righteously, which is an interesting comment, comment in his own right. So uh, again, he was temp uh, there was a temptation to take up rulership and leadership uh, on a political front which he declined. But maybe the, the last thing to share just before we, we, we finish these reflections is that um, going back a little bit to the um, not taking it personally, it's uh, when the mind uh, gets sabotaged and, and gets distracted and we find ourselves caught up in creating more problems for ourselves with creating a conflict, uh, creating worries, uh, creating guilt, creating self-criticism and or... or um, uh, say, making uh, commitments that are then going to take years and years and years to fulfill when we just finished the previous commitment. <laughs> that, uh, to, uh, it's very easy for the mind to get into to guilt and shame and self-criticism. So looking at this area, it's very helpful to remember that Hiri and Otapa, which outside the, the doors of the temple, there's two devas, uh, 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 the devas on either side of the main doors, the, the one with the red... Um, aura and the one with the blue aura, they represent Hiri and Otapa, which is moral sensitivity and the quality of conscience. That Hiri and Otapa are, are great spiritual strengths. They, they are 
the, they're representing the qualities of, of moral sensitivity, sense of what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, but they are in themselves free of any kind of self-view, so that um, that recognition, that ow, <laughs> the, uh, realizing that the consequence of that action is painful, that there's no self necessarily involved in that. And that Hiri and Otapa uh, are not feeding a guilt trip or a self-hatred trip or being self-critical, but they are that very painfulness that helps us to protect the heart. They're called the Lokapala, the, the guardians of the world. So that's another thing to consider in this whole area is that allowing that the painfulness of unskillful action and attitude to be realized uh, that that is a useful pain, like the pain that the physical pain that protects our bodies, um, and so that uh, that hiri and otapa are taken as uh, understood to be signs of great spiritual strength, spiritual maturity, and that um, they are uh, so not something to to push away or to I don't want to feel any kind of that I've done anything wrong or there's anything bad, <laughs> but no, that hiri and otapa they they are. They are the guardians. They're, they're powerful and helpful qualities, but uh, uh, but they function most effectively uh, when there's no self-view, no conceit woven into uh, to those uh, uh, say aspects of the mind. But they they function free of self-view, free of conceit, and then they can help to guide us in a very effective way. So three o'clock has come round. I offer these thoughts for consideration today. Oh, I'd like to open things up for questions. Uh, please do use the microphone to uh, to ask, uh, as it's, otherwise it can be tricky for everyone to hear what the, the questions are. So if anyone has anything they'd like to ask about, please don't be shy. Is it? Um, I want to ask, like, when we are chanting, we always chant in Pali. Um, I've been doing Karaniya Metta for a long time, but the moment I uh, listen to the English version, I actually realize how meaningful and how um, in f useful for the day-to-day -day life. I just want to ask Ajahn why we are always chanting in Pali. Well, we aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a mixture because, uh, in a way, it's both respecting our our roots and also what is current. You know, um, the uh, um, being attuned to where we've come from and the origins, and then also being attuned to the present circumstance. So it's like looking after or respecting your parents and your ancestry, but also taking care of your day-to-day uh, -day business. So here at our monasteries we do a mixture of Pali and English. It's useful to have the, the, the Pali uh, for a number of reasons, not just out of a sort of um, a devotional aspect, but there's uh, many words in Pali don't have exact equivalents in English. And so learning the Pali and, and, uh, and f getting familiar with the Pali phrases, it's a way of internalizing the teaching in a complete in a more complete way and so that um uh you're you're, you're uh, not just making do with the english uh say uh attempt at conveying all the meanings but the over time then your sense of what the pali means gets stronger and stronger and more aspects of that uh, appear so uh, say words like um, sankara in Pali or vinyana, uh, they have many, many shades of meaning. And so you might say sankara is a formation or vinyana is consciousness or discriminative consciousness. But there's all kinds of nuances in the Pali that don't really come across in English without a whole sentence or a paragraph to explain. So uh, uh, we do a mixture. Um, and uh, I, I particularly like to recite the, the first three discourses of the Buddha. Um, the the, the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, the, the turning of the wheel on the middle way and the Four Noble Truths. And then the discourse on not-self, on uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not-self and the five 
the five groups, the five khandhas, and then the fire sermon, the Adita Pariyaya Sutta, on the six senses and raga, dosa, moha, passion, uh, uh, aversion, and delusion. So then people really get to know those phrases. Uh, they're sort of uh, embedded in the memory, so you can draw upon them and refer to them, and that they're, they're right there to hand when... And you're not just using the English version of them. So I feel it's, it's helpful to have both both pots on the cooker. Okay. So, but also maybe I can encourage people to ask questions based uh, particularly on the theme of today. Um, it's it's uh, okay to uh, ask about uh, tangential things, but particularly useful will be to look at today's theme. Please. The talk. Um, I was interested about the patterns that our parents give us that might lead us down the path of self sabotage. You said about the child, adult child of an alcoholic parent. Uh, and I wonder if you'd mind saying more about those sort of patterns. And also, I was wondering about the role that. Um, Delusion must play in <laughs> self-sabotage quite quite a bit, I would imagine. Thank you. Uh, the short answer to the second part is yes, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and when when people talk about um, how to introduce their children to Buddhism or how to um, get their children you know, interested in Buddhist uh, in Buddhist teachings or Buddhist meditation. Uh, almost invariably, I'll say, well, children mostly learn by example, and that um, uh, if uh, if they see that um, that when when dad or mum uh, is frustrated, they get they get angry and they lash out, then that's what they'll learn how to do. If they see that uh, then uh, when the they, uh, the mum or dad meets with something frustrating, they go, ooh. That's a challenge. <laughs> what do we do with this one? Then that's what they'll learn. So that um, I feel there's a huge amount that is inherited from parents and that um, uh, both beneficial, um, neutral and, and harmful. And so that part of the um, development of, of Dhamma practice is what they call uh, atanyuta, kind of knowing your own character, exploring your own character, and so uh, looking to see what, where those influences come from or how they how they take shape in our life can be very very helpful. And it's not always the case that that something that's been harmful is not useful. That it can be that because of a particular situation, if it was used skillfully, then it can bring great strengths. But um, getting to know, uh, to explore what those influences are can be very, very beneficial to us. Uh, as, as I was saying, it's good to have not too much of a fixed idea, like, I know where this comes from. It's because you know, my dad was cold and remote. And uh, I remember reading a, um, a book by Robert Bly, the poet, and he said uh, his definition of the, the, the Western father figure is that which sits in the in the office and hides behind the newspaper yes <laughs> i could relate to that but uh but you say oh i know it's all because my dad was remote or my mum was was uh you know, was too fussy or whatever but i feel it's good to say well maybe that's that feels like it might be a contributory element but let's Let's keep looking and exploring and see what else is in the picture. So I would say don't, for us not to be too quick to, to fix things in, in place. But like I was saying, when, when uh, Yvonne Rand gave me that article, it was kind of spooky. It's like, wow, this is really like mapping out my family dynamic from an American psychologist. And I grew up in Southeast England. So that, that this seems to be very closely related to what I was experiencing, despite the closeness of the mapping. Like, wow, that's... And it never crossed my mind before. So it really made me, okay, so how would that work? How, how does that affect things? And you're, you're aware that it's not the only influence, but, but it can be part of it. So, for example, again, talking about my dad. Um, so he was the youngest child of Victorian parents. His father was born in 1863, and his mother in 1875. So my grandfather, 
was born before London had electricity, before motor cars existed. So uh, my dad, they, they, uh, my dad was the youngest child of, of my, grand, my grandparents. And so the world he grew up in was a sort of Victorian Edwardian household. And so um, then, uh, and I didn't really, uh, didn't really twig the effect that would have until I was about the age my dad was when I was born. <laughs> That's kind of, I found I could put myself in his shoes and I'd, I'd remember back to me sort of raging at him, raging at him when I was a teenager about how he didn't understand anything and he was old fashioned and then I began to see, well, but it, when he was a teenager, it was 1930, 1925, <laughs> it was a very, and his parents were from a whole different era, of course. His experience of the world is totally different from mine. What an idiot I was to expect him to be able to understand teenage children in the 1960s. Duh. <laughs> so uh, you, I, it, was, uh, it was interesting how I felt a lot more compassion for, for him, being in the role of being a dad in this sort of whole new age where everything was changing. And his own experience of childhood was, was so radically different. Edwardian London uh, uh, as a child. So that um, um, that you know that, that kind of um, appreciation of the effect our parents have, and the very and also the not just the just destructive or obstructive qualities, but the very valuable ones. So I often uh, point out how um, I I didn't appreciate how unfair people's parents could be, or how biased between their children uh, until I lived in community, really. It was, uh, uh, and so, um, and also being in the role of, of teaching. So in my, in my own family, uh, I have two elder sisters and myself, and it was absolutely fair shares for all. No one got preferential treatment. We were very different characters and were interested in different things, but everyone got fair shares. No one was ever shown any favoritism. No one was the favorite child. Um, and that was kind of a very level playing field in my family. And I had assumed that was the same for everybody. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the years later, I'm living in community and people say, oh no, my, my brother was the favored one. My, po my, my parents told me they weren't going to waste any money sending me to good school because I wasn't worth it. Go, they said, what? So, oh yes, yeah, so that was ordinary. Like they would just say that, they'd say that to your face. Oh yes. Yeah. Repeatedly. So that sense of fair shares for all and treating everyone equally, I inherited that uh, from my parents. So it's kind of an obvious way for me to relate to the, my children in the monastery. <laughs> I have about 40 children here. So uh, that, uh, that it's completely natural to, to have no favorites, no preferential treatment for anybody. It's fair shares for all, equal shares for all. So. Again, that's helpful to appreciate. Wow, where did I get that from? Well, <laughs> Mom and Dad. That was so. Uh, that sense of of uh, ref, ref, you know, exploring and reflecting on those influences, and then it can bring up gratitude and 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 uh, seeing you know, the many blessings that are there, and that the um, that and also another thing that was. I didn't really appreciate until I lived in community was my parents. I never saw my parents argue ever my whole life. So occasionally my mother would grumble that she wasn't particularly pleased with the decision that our father had made. <laughs> so the air would go slightly blue occasionally, but they never argued and uh, at least in front of the children. So we never saw the parents did not never modeled conflict. And then again, living with other people and seeing how um, many people had grown up in a house with uh, parents just uh, fighting over and over and over again, just as normal. And uh, realizing, wow, that's, that must have taken incredible discipline, <laughs> like not in front of the children. <laughs> and that they would work out their differences between themselves, but the, the, the children weren't pulled into it or, or called into side with one or the other. And I thought, that's a very significant absence. <laughs> And that, uh, and I'm not saying necessarily that's a bad thing in people's lives, but it's very stressful, difficult to deal with for, for young children. 
So uh, I do feel it's helpful to consider those influences and then to learn from them, the painful ones, the neutral ones and the, and the blessed ones. And then in the second part of the question, yes, delusion is very much involved in uh, self-sabotaging because it's, it's unconscious. Yeah, please go ahead. Pick up, please pick up the microphone. Please, yeah, otherwise. If you can switch it on, slide the little switch upwards. No? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're... Reverend sir, if I could beg for an explication. I'm a Buddhist by birth and by tradition in Sri Lanka. I'm, I'm if you like, struggling with the question of the three fundamental tenets of Buddhism, Anicca, Dukkha, and Atma. And Atma is the concept of no substantial self, and the belief in rebirth, which with Buddhism is almost consonant to the outside world. So my question in a nutshell is, what is reborn? Is the question. I know that... So you could Christmas hold the Humphreys, microphone closer to your mouth. Yeah. Sir Christmas Humphreys, he does try to answer the, in one of his books uh, what the Buddha taught. In that book he attempts to answer, but I would like an... I'm really having difficulty with reconciling the concept of anatma, the concept of no-self, with what entity is reborn. I, I don't know if I've made myself clear. Yes, yeah, you're, you're by no means the first person to ask that question. Thank you. So I would say... Um, the teaching of anatta is, does not mean no self. There's actually no place in the Pali Canon where the Buddha says there is no self. And in fact, uh, when uh, he, uh, he, does, says, uh, he does say at one point, if uh, someone holds the opinion there is no self, then that is a wrong view. Uh, anatta means not self. So rather than being a, a, a philosophical belief, uh, anicca dukkha anatta, anicca dukkha anatta, they are tools for ex examining, exploring our own experience. So uh, saying um, rupang anatta, the body is not self, um, then the, the Buddha says, if it was a self, then you could say of the body, be like this, don't be like, don't be like that. But because the body is not self, then it can't be said of the body, be like this, don't be like that. It doesn't obey. If it was self, it would obey. It's not, uh, so therefore it's not self. So it's a method of exploring the habits of identification. I, I, I am my body, I am my personality, I am my thoughts, I am my emotions. Um, and it's a way of getting perspective. Uh, on those habits of self-creation. So it's not a belief that there is no self, but rather it's a way of, of letting go of the identification with the, with the five khandas, with what we tend to think of as who and what we are, uh, our body, our personality, our personal story, our name, so on and so forth. Um, and when you say what entity is reborn, entity is not quite the right word. <laughs> so what is reborn... Uh, the short answer is habits. So whatever is unfinished business, whatever the mind is, it's like uh, we don't have to think of it across lifetimes, but whatever was uh, exciting and interesting to you yesterday will probably be exciting and interesting to you today. Whatever you were worried about yesterday, you probably find yourself being worried about today. So that um, whatever the mind is attached to, uh, positive, neutral, or, 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 or negative, then those attachments are what carry on. So what is reborn is habits of attachment. Uh, Tanupadana is when the, the, uh, the, what the Buddha says, when, when Vajragata asks the Buddha, what is it that sustains a, a being when one life comes to an end and before another life begins, what is the fuel that sustains a being? And the Buddha says, well, just like when there's a forest fire and flame leaps from one tree to another, what sustains the fire um, uh, as it jumps from one tree to another, its fuel is the air, the oxygen. So the fuel for an entity or a being uh, between one life and the next is tanhupadana, craving is the fuel. So it's uh, also like the, there's habits of attachment is another way of describing it. So uh, when there are no habits of attachment, there's no identification, then there's no more rebirth. So that um, the, uh, 
the, an, an example I like to give, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it, I feel it's quite relevant, is, say, if you, uh, if you have a, a bit of knowledge of, of the physics of waves and how they work, wave mechanics. So if you're standing on the seashore and you see a wave coming in from the open sea and then breaking on the beach, it looks like there's a single wall of water that's coming in and then breaking up on the shore. It's not. The actual molecules of water are moving in a circle or in a kind of oval shape. And what's moving is the wave of energy. That's what's moving into the shore. The actual water is just, uh, the, the water molecules are just going in a circle. And it's the energy that forms the wave and breaks on the shore. So we can look at our, our life as that, like a, that wave of energy. And it picks up molecules of uh, carbon and, and nitrogen and oxygen and phosphorus and uh, these materials that we eat and we breathe and we, uh, we excrete uh, that are coming and going through the body all the time. But what carries on is that wave of identification and attachment. And whatever the mind is attached to, that will condition the place and the quality, the, the nature of the next birth. It's not a being, it's not an entity, it's a, a collection of energetic wave forms. And when there, there's no more attachment, no more identification, then there's no more rebirth. doesn't mean uh, there's a, annihilation, because again, the Buddha said that those who say, I speak, I teach the annihilation of an existent being, they misrepresent me, they do not teach what I teach. Uh, what I teach is the, that the uh, suffering arises and suffering passes away. <laughs> the origin of dukkha and the cessation of dukkha, that's what I teach. So he wouldn't be drawn on those kind of philosophical issues to, uh, to talk about what happens to an enlightened being after the death of the body. He said, you know, that, there's, that question doesn't apply. You can't talk about an entity. You can't talk about where, where do they go. Those questions, don't, don't, they're not meaningful. They don't apply. But um, uh, what we are doing with Buddhist meditation, insight meditation, is establishing that heart in that quality of awareness that knows all those arisings and ceasings, but is not identified with them, it's not attached to them. So that's vipassana, is exactly that, uh, letting go of those waves and establishing the clear awareness that knows those waves as they arise and cease, and it's not contributing to more of them. But if we can stick on today's theme, that would be a great thing. So. Is there any further questions? So please, yes. Oh, you had one earlier that you were, you were going to ask. Yeah, go ahead. It takes a second yeah, to come live. There we go. It? Thank you for the talk. Um, I was very interested in what you were saying about how, like, a, a self-sabotaging behaviour could be driven by um, identification. Um, and I was thinking, you know, in, in therapy or in psychology, we might try and like seek to replace like a negative identification um, with something more positive, a more positive sense or at least of the neutral. self. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, when really we want to let go of identifications. So I just wondered if you could say more about that. Yeah, good question. Good question. I mean, it's a. Uh, in, in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the 12-step programs, uh, one of the, I, I, when I was living in America, I had a, a lot of a, a close connection with quite a lot of people in AA programs and with um, using Buddhist teachings uh, as, as a 12-step program and so forth. And uh, one of the things that, is, um, uh, that they use very consciously and very actively is rather than just trying to stop drinking and having nothing to take, take its place, that uh, it, was, uh, it became very clear to me in 12-step uh, in groups and, and in AA, they smoke a lot of cigarettes and drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> uh, because that, uh, to, to say, you know, I'm going to go completely clean, I'm not going to have anything that's stimulating or addictive, or, then for most human beings, that's too much. It's, ask, it's asking too much. And so um, uh, within the Buddha's teaching, it's like you're replacing a really unwholesome object with at least a less unwholesome object or a neutral object or a wholesome object. So you're, you're deliberately substituting one object for another. And so that um, if, uh, uh, if you are, are say, f uh, fixated on a, a negative identity, to, have, to create some kind of more 
wholesome identity like being a meditator, <laughs> belonging to a Buddhist group, or uh, being a Buddhist monastic. You know, that that uh, uh, it gives you a uh, you're reflecting. It's not an absolute truth. It's not completely and wholly who and what you are, but it's more helpful to identify with that structure than with something that is destructive and and, uh, and harmful. So if you're particularly if you're conscious that it's a stepping stone, that it's a it's not a final thing like I really am a Buddhist or I am a meditator or I, I am a spiritual person and that the um, that uh, uh, if that's recognized as a convenient fiction or a helpful form to, to use, then it can be extremely beneficial. If it's a, an, another identity that's then uh, clung to, um, then it, it can have sort of destructive aspects to it as well. Like you become afraid or critical of other people who are not like you, or you're uh, fearful and aversive to your past, and you kind of uh, uh, there's a, a, a kind of a reactive and a afflicted uh, attitude towards where you've come from. So the more that we can recognize that any kind of new identity is, is a, a convenient fiction, it's a persona, it's a useful tool, um, and it, it works you know, as a tool, it's a useful tool, <laughs> but uh, it's not absolutely who and what we are, then if that's the most skillful way of using that kind of fresh identity, like and they, the people in AA, they know that you know, drinking another cup of, co of strong coffee isn't going to make them happy forever. But in this moment, yes, good coffee. <laughs> that's it. You know, that's, uh, they, that's, that's all they're expecting it to do. And so uh, I feel that practical, a, a, a practical sense of, of our own limitations and working with that. It's like uh, in Ajahn Chah's monastery, a lot of the Sangha members... They, they're they quite engaged in, in physical tasks or building the monastery or, or sewing and crocheting and uh, uh, the um, uh, handicrafts of various kinds. And Ajahn Chah wouldn't, uh, wouldn't kind of dismiss that. So some of our, our Sangha members are, are very gifted at macrame and crochet and artwork of various kinds, sculpture. Ajahn Vimalo is an absolutely brilliant sculptor. Uh, and so some of the forest monasteries, it's like, no, just practice, practice, practice. And it's all sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk. And anything else is, is extraneous. And, you know, there's a, I, I'm not belittling that. That's a very noble intention. But the number of people who can really live that way and live effectively uh, with that kind of limitation, it's, it's pretty small proportion. So Ajahn Chah's style was say, okay, if you want to spend half your half your day crocheting bowl covers and spoon covers and covers for your crochet hooks, okay. <laughs> You'll probably see the limitations of that in, in due course, but and you can see that the pride your pride you have in this the most beautiful bowl stand. So I I can speak from personal personal experience. I felt I had that the the abbot of what Pananachat was a very good at hand was very good at handicrafts and he'd learned different crafts from the villagers. He was an American a Vietnam veteran, American former American soldier, and he was very good with his hands. And he learned how to do the weaving rattan from the local one of the local villages in in uh, in Bung Wai village. And so he decided he could try and make us a, a bowl stand using this traditional rattan. A woven rattan work, so he created the first one, and I was I was his attendant and his novice, so he taught me how to do it, and I spent three months making this bowl stand, and I was really proud of it. Like this is the most beautiful bowl stand in the world. So we have a very different value system in the monastery. So we're not worrying about getting on, you know, on the, making a million pounds or getting on the cover of Vogue or anything. Your, 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 the few things that you have, your robes and your, the color of your robes, the perfect brown for your robes or the, your exquisite bowl stand. So I was, I was very attached to this bowl stand. And it's the most beautiful bowl stand in the world. It's far more elegant than the Ajans. His is kind of chunky, mine is exquisite. And so I was a, I was a little novice. I was a 21-year-old novice. And uh, we went to, to go and visit another branch monastery in Ayutthaya. And the... Uh, the abbot of the monastery, who was quite senior, he was over 20 reigns, and he saw my bowl stand and said, oh, 
will you give that to me? Uh, which is very rare for an Ajahn to say, please give me this possession of yours. And I just said, no. <laughs> it's like, nope. Yeah, I think Tandun can understand. It's kind of an outrageous thing to do. Like, nope, I can't let it go. <laughs> So, you know, handicrafts, like spending three months making a, a stand for your bowl to sit on, as uh, Ajahn Chah would be quite okay with, with us doing that. And that uh, because of that, um, you know, better than leaving the robe and going off and, and um, turning your back on meditation and, and uh, Buddhist practice because it's too tight. So he gave people quite a lot of latitude and, uh, to do that kind of thing or... or um, to, to not have quite such a tight fit. And I think it's one of the reasons why he became uh, as a very popular um, teacher and his teaching very widespread was because he, he had a sense for the, the, the human limitations that we have and working, working with those limitations and those finding ways that we can transmit, transform our more destructive tendencies into at least neutral, <laughs> like uh, handicrafts. You know. It's not going to save the world having a beautiful rattan and bamboo bowl stand but uh, it uh, it's pretty innocent in its own right as a as a uh, postscript to that story my perfect bowl stand the most beautiful bowl stand in the world what happened was uh, when i came back to england um the uh, the second rains retreat i was here in 1981 i was down in devon uh, the third day of the rains retreat i had left my uh, my bowl stand uh, with the rest of my things in this caravan. I went out for the morning walk, the arms around with my bowl and my robes. And when I came back to the place where I was staying for the Vasa, there was this large plume of smoke rising up from the, uh, the, the farmyard and the caravan was completely up in flames. And of my perfect bowl stand, there was absolutely no trace, like burnt to dust. No, not even a mark where it had been sitting. Just, so, it's anicchata, it's impermanence, was the final sign of its perfection. <laughs> so, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. I hope, uh, anyway, I hope that, was, that answers your, your question. So, please, go ahead if you want to. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask about whether um, Mara is like a metaphor or for the sabotaging thought that I see this sabotaging thought or I see this unhelpful thought or whether Mara is an actual deity. And I'm a bit worried about why Mara is female. He he is not. Ma, uh, Mara is a is a female name in Eastern Europe, but uh, it is a uh, it's one of the again this might seem a bit sexist, but um, Buddhas are always male, Maras are always male, and the uh, the world uh, rulers are always the Chakravati rulers or emperors are always male. So it might seem unfair, but Mara is is definitely, in the, according to the mythology, is is a is a guy. And whether Mara is an actual actual deity or a, um, a metaphorical presence, that's up for each individual to explore. So. <laughs> Some people say this is totally metaphorical, isn't it? But in in the scriptures, it's, there are these quite quite uh, clear dialogues like the Buddha talking with another entity um, but I also feel that represent, it's representing thoughts that are arising in the Buddha's mind and it's cast into the form of Mara coming along saying you know you could turn the whole Himalayas into solid gold if you wanted to so it's cast in the form of Mara coming along and trying to pretend that uh, that because Mara is always invisible first of all and that uh, the um, uh, when, and when the Buddha says, I know you, Mara, yeah, I know what this is, and then the, the first thing that Mara says is, oh, the Blessed One knows me, the, the, the Sublime One knows me. It's like, damn, he's recognized me. 
So Mara is coming along in a, in a, in a uh, surreptitious way, in an insidious way. So it's not kind of appearing with sort of curly moustache and like a music hall villain. Ha 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 ha. But uh, it's that insidious voice in the back of the mind that says, you know, if you wanted to, you could. So it's always the blessed one knows me, the sublime one knows me. So he's trying to influence the flow of thought and attitude without it being realized. And then, dang, he's recognized me again. And uh, there's, so that's all, um, pretty much always the case that uh, Mara's trying to have his influence without being recognized. But it's definitely portrayed as, a, as, a, as an entity. But uh, what is a living being? What is an entity? That's another whole philosophical area for exploration. Maybe another Sunday talk next year. So, so time for one more, yes. It takes a moment to come on, yeah. Not yet. Oh, it's on That's now. it, yes. Just want to say that there's a fantastic talk from Ajahn on Mara, and I just listened to it, so then maybe that's a good reference uh, to the question, Ajahn. I was, I was thinking about this self-sabotage, and I, I always feel like if you zoom out a little, and I was feeling this because I... I changed my job recently, and I did. You see yourself as. Sorry. I, was, I didn't quite catch the. Oh, the, sorry. I, I did change my job recently, and I was reflecting what's going to be the implications of this, and because it's going to take more time, and etc. And I thought it would take time out of med meditation, etc. And I thought this is going to be not going to be good for my spiritual life. But then, you always tend to think about the career and. Other, other, other intentions you have in lay life, and I always feel this because you get, you have your not unwholesome but your practical uh, needs and goals and uh, objectives in life, and you have that, and then you have your spiritual. I don't want to say goals, but the path you want to take, and I was, I was struggled to reconcile, and I was, I, I was listening to this talk from a Sinhalese monk, and he was saying how you get trapped like like a fish in a in a hook where you would take you know you go on the lay life and how you get trapped and I, I feel that way sometimes. Do you I'm probably a very broad question, but do you have any <laughs> reflections on that? How do we because I can although I can say logically the, the part, but I, I struggle to then I see the part and I know the our feeling I'm gonna get, but same time, you have, you want to buy a new house, you want to get a new job and all these things, and then, but you still carry on. How do we, how do we reconcile the two? <laughs> uh, well, I can't really speak um, from a place of experience because I never tried to be a lay Buddhist. Uh, I've often mentioned that uh, as soon as uh, my, my encounter with Buddhism was, uh, it really was, walking into the monastery in Thailand and I didn't walk out. So I was a lay Buddhist for about three weeks before I became an Anagarika. That's my experience of being a lay Buddhist was three weeks living in the monastery before taking the eight precepts. So I don't have any experience of trying to have a job or a partner or a, uh, functioning in the world. So I can't speak from a place of experience. But uh, uh, that said, I would say it's a, a question of, of priorities. If you, the, if you hold the place where you live and the job that you have, if you just see these as convenient ways of providing a roof over the head, you know, food for your stomach, um, support for your, your family, um, and then you're not, you're not assuming that it's going to be anything that could possibly be ultimately satisfying or rewarding, then you can. Then you're holding it in a different way. Like I'm supposed to have job satisfaction. Well, this is you know, I, 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 my job, my work has to make an imp a real impact in the world. Um, uh, you know, we we can certainly do things. We can set up institutions and work to bring about some benefit, but it, it can only be partial. You know, it, it can only have a, a relative effect in in the world. You know, we can. 
we we do what we can to bring benefit and and wholesomeness and and say uh, goodness into the lives of others but we can we can only do so much uh, and uh, the say in terms of worldly activity there's no completion so if you see the the, the world and this is the same with the monastery you know it's not just worldliness does not stop at the monastery gate you might be surprised to hear <laughs> you know you because you can relate to building a monastery and and uh, and the struct physical structures that we have here or the things that we do here um you can relate to those in very worldly terms but you you can't build the perfect building that will enable everyone to be enlightened or cause everyone to be enlightened who goes into it you can't have a monastery routine that will uh, bring bring everyone perfect samadhi and panya yeah concentration and wisdom yeah. it doesn't work that way so if you know that well these are just structures and they we set them up in a good way as uh, as good a way as possible to help people but uh, ultimately there's no completion buildings are falling apart before you've even finished building them you know the, the rebar that's been put into the, the pilings of the new sala is already decaying and we haven't even built the building yet that's nature so there in in the worldly terms there's no completion so you're not looking for completion or, or fulfillment in worldly terms you, you do things as in the best way you can you work hard to create helpful conditions but that can only do so much like Ajahn Chah would say there's no doctor that can cure every disease and, and all the doctors will die one day anyway <laughs> so, but it doesn't mean to say there's no point being a doctor you know that you do what you can to help relieve disease and it's great it's very helpful so you do what you can on the worldly front but you realize like you can't build a building that will never fall down you can't you can't be such a good doctor that every patient that, that you meet is is completely cured forever it doesn't happen so uh, if you see the worldly conditions as as things that can be supportive but they can't be providing total fulfillment in and of themselves then that's a skillful attitude towards that and then if you see that those worldly conditions uh, what the, the best they can do is to provide an environment where you can train your heart where there, where completion is possible where there, there is a finality is possible and so that's where to put the main focus and again teachers like uh, Ajahn Chah and and you know, in the Buddha's teaching itself, it's like that's you know that's where we can find genuine fulfillment, genuine completeness, and that uh, and 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 the fulfillment of our potential is in the the training of the jitta. So the uh, establishing the, the perfect monastery, or having the perfect job, or the most sort of you know, eco-friendly business, <laughs> it can only do so much. Uh, but uh, if we see those aspects of, of lay life again I'm not speaking from direct experience but if we see the our job our living place and the, those structures as providing a supportive environment within which uh, you're creating the best conditions for helping the heart to awaken be li and be liberated then that's the best we can do so I think four o'clock has come around so draw things to a close today so uh, next week uh, Ajahn Kemaka will be offering the Sunday afternoon talk on the theme the power of the precepts so you know, please do come along and uh, uh, listen to Ajahn Kemaka's reflections next week and I will be going into retreat for three weeks uh, from Friday so you hopefully you won't see me around but I'll be in my in my kuti but not uh, not around and about the monastery so i wish you all well take care <laughs>